And again, this is perfectly indistinguishable from what we had before because these proofs are perfectly witness indistinguishable. We can't distinguish whether we're using the bits from a real witness in making the proofs or whether we're using just some, some arbitrary assignments that respect the NAND gates when making the proofs. So that's what the perfect witness and distinguishability of the zero one proofs gives us. And well, this last experiment, that's actually exactly what the simulator does. So in other words, we have that the adversary's chance of outputting one in a real proof is negligible different from chance of outputting one in a simulated proof on a simulated common reference string. So we have proven that this is actually zero knowledge. And actually it's zero knowledge in a very nice way, something I can composable zero knowledge in, which is stronger than the standard version um, mode of, of uh, defining non-interactive zero knowledge. It's zero knowledge in the sense that if you look at the common reference string, they're computationally indistinguishable. But as soon as you are using a simulation common reference string, it's actually, the rest is actually a perfect simulation. It's perfect zero knowledge on a simulation reference string. Okay. So to, to summarize, what we have now is a non-interactive zero knowledge proof of asserted satisfiability. Um, which works as follows, we commit to all the wires. For each of those commitments, we pro to prove that it contains zero or one. For each NAND gate, we give a proof that it's respected. And we have a fairly small size of the proof, and it's a fairly simple construction. We get perfect completeness, perfect soundness, composable zero knowledge. And actually, we could even say that it's a proof of knowledge in the sense that it gives us something more than soundness. If you set up the common reference string such that they had an extraction trapdoor, that you actually had the decryption key, then you would be able to decrypt all these commitments and see whether it contains zero or one, and you could actually extract the witness from a proof. Um, should we take a, a short break? So, yeah, so let's meet again a quarter to, to uh, something like that. So seven minute break, <laughs> if that's okay. One of, of the agenda I wanted to show you how to use pairing based techniques to construct some, some fairly simple non-interactive zero knowledge proof for circuit satisfiability. And, and now I kind of want to, to go, go ahead and, and uh, move on to, to if one of the cool things about pairing based techniques, one of the theoretical advances in our knowledge of non-interactive zero knowledge proofs, namely how to get perfect uh, zero knowledge. Okay, so we have this, this picture, right, where pretty quickly people found out how to give interactive proofs that have either computational zero knowledge or perfect zero knowledge. And we have non-interactive uh, proofs that had computational zero knowledge. And it turns out that pairing-based techniques actually is something very similar to this construction can give us perfect and everlasting zero knowledge. Okay. And actually, it's an extremely simple idea. Okay. Instead of starting with H that has order Q, we just start with H having order N on the common reference string. Okay. And as we saw before, it's easy to verify with perfect completeness, exactly the same computations as before. Actually, the zero knowledge proof proved that we have perfect zero knowledge, right? Because the only difference in the zero knowledge proof between real proof and simulated proof was when we changed the common reference string from order Q to order N. Now we're starting out with order N, so we have actually perfect zero knowledge. So that kind of comes automatically. And now we are all getting very excited, but we still have to check what about happens with the soundness. And there's actually a subtle issue here, okay? And, and it turns out that the natural 
and I said it in quotes because I actually think it's wrong definition of soundness, uh, but the one I gave you in the beginning, it, it, it may fail here. We, we, don't, we don't know whether it fails or not, but, but we don't have a proof that it is actually sound in that sense. Um, so, so the problem is that the natural way to, to prove it is, would be to do something like this. Okay, we start with H having order N, and we have some adversary that proves a false statement. Okay? And then we would try to, to switch and say, now H has order Q, and since the adversary cannot distinguish, it must have the, roughly the same chance of, of proves, giving an, an, a statement and, and accepting proof. Okay. The problem here, so this argument is actually very good if we just talk about non-adaptive soundness. It works perfectly fine. The problem is that the statement may depend on the common reference string, and if the statement depends on the common reference string, this reduction doesn't work. Okay, and here's an example. Consider the statement that H has order Q, right? Then if we're looking at the case where H has order N, it's a first statement, but as soon as we switch to H having order Q, it's actually a true statement. Okay, and then, well, maybe down here it actually works out and the adversary can give the proof. So this is kind of a very uh, subtle issue with, with soundness. Um, what we can prove is that we have something I call adaptive co-soundness. So it has non-adaptive soundness. It also has adaptive co-soundness. Okay? Um, and, and essentially what adaptive co-soundness says is that the adversary cannot give a proof for a statement that it knows is false. Okay? So in other words, we don't rule out that the case where the adversary gives a proof for a false statement, as long as the adversary has no clue that it's actually a false statement. But it cannot knowingly give a proof for a false statement. So we define it the following way. We generate the common reference string. The adversary comes up with a circuit. A witness for the circuit being not satisfiable. Okay, so now we're looking at languages which are in NP intersect co-NP and a proof. And we say it's computational it's co-sound if for all polynomial time adversaries the probability of rejecting here is roughly one. Okay. And now we can we can actually give a proof that it is co-sound. So the sketch is roughly as follows. We start with this reference string where H has order N and where the adversary produces a circuit and a witness that it's unsatisfiable and it proves a, gives a, a proof, okay? And by the subgroup decision assumption, it can't distinguish with H has order N or order Q. It must have roughly the same probability of producing the circuit and a witness that is unsatisfiable and a proof that's accepting. But now, this witness that is unsatisfiable guarantees that it is unsatisfiable. At the same time, when H has order Q, we have perfect soundness, and we reach a contradiction. Right? This is impossible. So therefore, we conclude that we could not, that this was just a figment of our imagination. Such an adversary doesn't exist. Okay, and now, um, in general, when I see cryptographers writing some paper where they slightly tweak a definition to make the scheme work, I get a little suspicious. So I kind of want to argue that this is actually, I'm, I'm not trying to cheat you, this is a, a notion that makes sense, okay? Um, so, so in some sense, I think adaptive cosine is, is the right notion to use in, in non-interactive zero-knowledge proofs. Um, and the reason is that, well, first of all, there's an argument that it is, it's actually hard, it seems to be a hard thing to get the, the, the stronger adaptive soundness definition. Um, the standard techniques we have for proving security don't work in that, that setting. Um, the second argument is that there's actually a lot of scenarios where a co-witness does exist. Okay, consider some kind of any type of protocol, for instance, where we are claiming something about the ciphertext that 
uh, the plain text inside a cipher text. Well, if we have a decryption key, we could just we could potentially decrypt and check whether the statement is true or false. So in that same setting, a, a witness does actually exist to to testify whether the statement is true or false. And it might not be that something that's that's. I mean, it could be inherent, dig down somewhere in the system. I mean, maybe it's some kind of. Uh, or the threshold secret sharing or something, but if you could somehow from the system, from the knowledge of all parties, pull out a co-witness, then we can actually use the definition of adaptive co -summers. So it's a useful definition, um, and actually it it's, turns out that it, it, it works perfectly fine. It's, it's sufficient if you want to prove, for instance, that there exist universal, composable, non-interactive zero-knowledge proofs. So, so this adaptive cosine is that's exactly what is given in the UC framework. And I think that's kind of a good litmus test whether it makes, makes sense or not. Uh, the UC framework is a good way to, to test whether the definition captures exactly the right uh, security property. So I think it is, it is a, a definition that, that makes a lot of sense and I don't think I'm, I'm cheating anybody by just achieving adaptive cosine instead of adaptive soundness. Okay, so so now we have a perfect non-interactive zero knowledge argument for circuit satisfiability, right? We start with H that has order n, and then we do everything as a as we did before, right? We commit to all the wires, we prove that they contain zero ones, we prove that the NAND gate are respected, and we get this very short non-interactive zero knowledge argument. And it has perfect completeness. Now it has computational co-soundness and perfect zero knowledge. So to, to summarize uh, this, this first part, part of the talk, now we have non-interactive zero knowledge proofs for certain satisfiability built from pairing based techniques. And what we can do is we can set up the common reference string in two different ways. One where H has order Q, and one where H has order N. If it has order Q, we get perfect sound, soundness computational zero knowledge. If it has order N, we get computational co-soundness and perfect zero knowledge. And we can just switch those strings, and actually an adversary cannot distinguish. And this is the only place where there's a difference between these two. That's in the choice of the common reference string, and the adversary cannot tell whether common reference string is one type or the other. So that's kind of the, the short picture of, of what we have done so far. Okay, so, so, so the perfect zero knowledge property was actually something that came really easily once you start using pairings. I mean, it was just a question of whether we start with one common reference string or the other, and then we actually get perfect zero knowledge. Okay, so now in the second part of the talk, I want to talk about uh, efficiency. Okay, so I kind of want to move towards something that, that really is practical and you would use in, in your everyday design of cryptographic protocols. Um, and the problem with what we have seen so far before is that Non-interactive proofs have typically been given for some kind of general NP-complete la language such as circuit satisfiability or Hamiltonian circuits or things like that. And, and that's really a, a problem. I mean, if you have even a very simple statement such as here's a cipher text and has a signature on this message, okay, then we have to go through a, a, a reduction to this circuit, circuit satisfiability and that really blows up the size, right? I mean, even if even a simple statement like this actually leads to a very large circuit. And it's fine, we can give a very efficient proof for the circuit, but if it's a large circuit, we're still losing a lot of computational and, and communication on that. Okay? So what we have seen now, so we, we before pairings, we had some inefficient proofs, circuit size fibrosity, now we have efficient proof for circuit satisfiability. But what we really want to do is to move towards giving non-interactive zero knowledge proofs for things that we use in practice. Okay? And that's what's coming up now. So we want something that has high efficiency and, and gives us practical non-interactive proofs.
Okay. And there's um, so there's kind of a, a, a trade-off here, I think. So um, one thing one could do is you could give some, some very concrete zero knowledge proofs that are tailored to what you're doing in your protocol. An example of, of that is, is Bonnet and uh, Boyen and Waters group signature schemes where they actually do these kind of non-interactive zero knowledge proofs under the hood. And they kind of build something that's an ad hoc solution for their group signature scheme and, and it works. Okay. But I kind of want to go beyond that as well because I don't want designers of cryptographic protocols to start all over again each time they have the protocol. So I would kind of want to capture something that is general and practical at the same time. Something that is general in the sense that it's NP complete, but at the same time practical such that if you have a concrete statement, you're working with some pairing based construction, then you don't have to do some kind of reduction to an NP complete language and, and do a lot on a lot of that. I would want something that can give you a, a direct non interactive zero knowledge proof. Okay? And, and what we've settled on is, is to look at constructions in bilinear groups, right? So that's fairly general because bilinear groups are used in all over the place for constructing cryptographic protocols. And, and we are allowing all kinds of op operations in these bilinear groups. So, so we might imagine that are some, verb, some parameters that are publicly known, right? So we have some group elements, we have some uh, exponents. Um, and now we do make some kind of construction, uh, a verifiable uh, um, uh, encrypted signature or something like that, right? And, and we can do all kinds of operations here, right? We can do operations with the exponents where we add and multiply elements. Uh, we can do exponentiations, okay? We can do pairings of elements, all these kind of operations in bilinear groups. And we would like to capture all these kind of constructions that you can build with these bilinear group operations. So what we would like to do is that once somebody has constructed some type of construction with all these operations in the bilinear groups, and somebody comes along and says, did you really construct them the right way? And I don't know your secret inputs, but I still want to verify whether everything corresponds to what there's supposed to be, then you can say, yeah, here's a proof. Okay. So we want to capture, again, as, as general as possible, right, there could be some elements of public, publicly known constants, known to both the proof and the verifier, could be exponents, field elements, could be group elements, both in the base group and the target group. Could, there could also be some of them that are secret, that the pool wants to keep secret, right? Could be both, again, exponents, or it could be uh, group elements. And we would like to enable the, all kinds of operations on these elements. So we would like to be able to add and multiply exponents, multiply elements in the group, use a bilinear map, multiply things in the target group. All the operations that you have in a bilinear group. So, so, so the goal now is to get something efficient, something that designers of cryptographic protocols to use, is to give non-interactive proofs for correctness of a set of bilinear group constructions. Um, so here we have it. Okay. So what we look, the kind of statements that we look at, are, st are statements where we have variables, we have group elements, or we have ring elements, okay? And then we look at all the kind of thing, things you can build from those secret variables, okay? So you could use the pairing operation and you could pair both. You could do pairings with publicly known elements with constants or you could do pairings of group elements with each other, right? So you could even raise it to some kind of exponent. So that kind of captures everything you can do with pairings. Okay. Same time you might do 
exponentiations, okay, you might construct this element by taking secret variables and raising them to constants, or taking constants and raising them to secret exponents, or you might actually combine group elements and exponents and even throw in some kind of constants. Or you could do equations in the ring, okay? You could build it by taking constants, multiplying them with, with secret variables, or you could take variables and multiply them with each other, and again, throwing in some constants. So that kind of captures everything you can do in the bilinear group, right? You can do operations in the ring, you can do exponentiations and multiplications, and you can do pairings and, and multiplications in the target group. And of course, well, okay, we only get degree two polynomials here, right? But obviously you can simply for start from a degree two and then you can throw in an intermediate element and build it up to degree four, or three, four, and so forth. So it really captures all kinds of things you can do with, with bilinear groups. So what we would like to do is to give efficient non-interactive witness distribution proofs for a statement that consists of a number of equations of these types we had from before. So the statement is, would basically consist of a number of equations, okay, could be pairing product equations or multi-exponentiation equations or quadratic equations in the ring. And what we want to say is that, well, there's some assignment of group elements, of secret group elements and secret exponents, such that all equations are satisfied at the same time. Okay? And we can actually do that. We can get non-interactive witness interesting proofs for all equations being satisfied, simultaneously satisfied by some assignment to the group elements and to the exponents. For non-interactive zero knowledge, turns out we can do that provided that all the pairing product equations end up giving one. But we don't know how to do it in, in the more general case. So here is some difference between witness indistinguishability and, and zero knowledge. It seems a little more efficient to get just witness indistinguishability. And actually, the common reference string will be just like the one we saw before. So it will be a very short common reference string. And, and the proofs will be pretty short as well. What we're going to do is we're going to take each variable, whether it's a group element or whether it's a, an exponent, and we're going to make a commitment to it. So that's one group element for each of those, the commitment. And then each equation is going to be one group element. We're going to give a proof for each equation which consists of just one group element. And this is actually really interesting, right? Remember these equations, they kind of look complicated, right? You could do all kinds of operations. You could have actually, each equation could be quite large, have a lot of constants involved, lots of variables. Still, the cost of each equation is just one group element, okay? So it has a very short proof. And the consequence is actually that actually sometimes we even end up with witness in distinguished proof and non interactive knowledge proof that have sublinear size compared to the statement. Statement is much more complicated, we just give a short proof. In general, that's not the case though. So in general, I wouldn't say that we get sublinear size, but in some cases we do. Okay, so I'm going to describe this construction to you now. So we're going to have a common reference ring which has either h with order q or h of order n with some known discrete logarithm with respect to g. And we're going to use commitments to the variables. So now if we have a group element, we're going to commit to it just by taking the group elements and multiplying h to r. Okay. So that still un uniquely defines, since if H has order Q, that uniquely defines the group of element in the order P subgroup. And to commit to exponents, we're going to use exactly the same commitment as we did before. 
but now we don't, we're not going to make some kind of proof that there's zero or one. I mean, there might be any value of modulo p. Okay, so if we have a, a common reference room where H has order Q, then these commitments are perfectly binding in the order P subgroups. And what we're going to get is we're going to get soundness with respect to the order P subgroups. And all bits are of what happens in, in the order Q subgroups. And if we have a simulation common reference string, one where H has order N, then these are actually perfectly hiding commitments. They're just random group elements because when H has order N, this is just a random group element. So we get perfect hiding and we actually get perfect witness indistinguishability. So I, I note that when we have H of order N, what we get is that we have a trapdoor for the exponents, okay? If we have a commitment to, to, to zero, we can open it to any value Y. Okay, it is not necessarily the case when we have a group element that we can open it to any value because that would involve computing a discrete logarithm and we don't know how to do that in general. Okay, now the commitments, they have some very nice homomorphic properties. Just as before, if we take commitments to exponents and multiply them, we get an additive homomorphic um, property, right, and we add exponents. If we take commitments to group elements and multiply them, get a commitment to the product of the group elements. And if we do the pairings, basically what happens with the committed values is that we do the same operation in that. So if we pair a commitment to two group elements, we get a, pair, a commitment to the pairing of the group elements that have been committed and so forth. So the nice thing about these commitments is that we can do all these kind of uh, uh, homomorphic operations, both additions and multiplications and, and pairings on the commitments, and exactly the same thing happens to the underlying messages that have been committed to. <coughs> and indeed, we're going to use that very much. Actually, the proofs will kind of take whatever equation you want to satisfy, and instead of having the variables, we just plug in the commitments and because we have these homomorphic properties, everything that happens along these equations when you do pairings and multiplication and so forth will happen to the underlying messages. Okay, so to illustrate that, so we have three types of equations. Okay, we have the quadratic equations in the ring. Uh, I'm going to skip those because some of them look very similar to each other. Um, so let me skip this one. Uh, we have the multi-exponentiation equations. Again, let me skip one and let me go right to the pairing product equation. Okay. So the pairing product equation, we wanted to prove that these committed variables satisfy this equation, right? So this one is publicly known and these are publicly known constants AIs and, and gamma IJs. But the XIs and, and, and Js, they are secret variables. And we want to prove that these committed secret variables satisfy this equation. Okay? So if we look at this value here, okay, so we take, so what we do is we simply take this, this value inverse, what it's the target that it's supposed to give, and then we plug in the commitments instead of the variables. Okay? And we use the pairings and those, okay? And doing a lot of computation, uh, what we get is actually since we have this homomorphic property that whatever we do to the commitments, we're actually doing to the committed var values at the same time, we actually can extract the xi's from this commitment and we have the xi's and xj's from these commitments. So we get this part and then we get a pairing of h with something else, okay, some complicated expression. And as you, as you may have guessed, this complicated expression here, that's going to be the proof, okay? And it's just one group element.
So what the verifier will do is simply plug in the commitments here and check that this equation here holds. And notice this thing here, if the statement is true, that's going to be one, right, by this equality. So this one here is just going to cancel out if the statement is true. So the verifier just has to check that this value where we plug in the commitments gives H paired with the proof. Okay, so the proof is this complicated expression and the verifier once has seen all the commitments and knows the proof that this satisfies this particular equation will plug in the values in the equation, the commitments into the equation and check that this is the same as H paired with the proof. And it has perfect completeness because when, when you do all the equations, this is exactly what you get. It has perfect soundness in the order P subgroup when H has order Q. Um, and there again, to see that, look at this equation here, right? So we have, what we're checking is that this term up here is equal to H paired with the proof. This thing here has order Q. So what the conclusion is that this term up here, so this, the conclusion is this term down here must be one in the order P subgroup. Okay? And if this thing here is all one in the order P subgroup, then it means this equation holds in the order P subgroup. So that gives us perfect soundness when H has order Q. And finally, there's a the question of, of witness indistinguishability. So when we ha H has order N, then all the commitments are perfectly hiding, okay? So they, any commitment can be seen as a commitment to any group element. There's some witness that would open to any group element or any exponent, okay? But no matter which witness we're looking at, okay? then there's only one unique possible proof that will come out of it, Maybe this one, right? H has order n, so there's only one possible proof that will satisfy this equation. So we, it's easy to see that no matter which witness we start out with, it's going to give the same proof. And that means the proof is perfectly windows built in. It doesn't reveal anything about which witness was used to prove that the equation was satisfiable by the commitments. Okay, so, so what we get for the full non-interactive witness indistinguishable proof of a set of equations is the, is the following. We commit to each variable, each group element, we commit to each um, variable exponent we make a non-interactive witness proof for each quadratic equation, for each multi-exponentiation equation, for each pairing product equation. Okay? Each commitment is one group element, so this is one group element for each variable, one group each element for each ring element. Okay? And then one group element for each of those equations of those three types. So it's a quite a simple construction again. Quite, quite efficient. Okay? And the properties of the, these proofs is that, well, we have two types of common reference string that are computationally indistinguishable. Either H has order Q, and we get perfect soundness. Okay? Or H has order N, in which case we get perfect witness indistinguishability. Okay, so, so this is kind of like, on the, the, as generalized as possible, this is kind of on the abstract level. So I kind of want to give you an example to see how it works in practice when we're designing cryptographic protocols. 
So what I'm going to look at is, is a ring signature scheme, okay? And, and to motivate what a, a ring signature is, is, let me imagine that we're looking at some employee in some anonymous fast food chain, okay? And it turns out that they are claiming to sell beef hamburgers, but actually they're using rat meat. <laughs> okay? And, and this employee, I mean, she's, she's actually quite an honest person. She wants to, you know, tell the world that, you know, something, something not, not so good is going on in this organization. But she is afraid that, you know, if she steps forward and says, you know, I work in, in this fast food chain and they're using rat meat, then probably she will be fired. Okay. On the other hand, if she just remains anonymous and sends some anonymous emails to journalists, she'll be ignored, right? Because who is this random person saying these false ac accusations? Okay. And what you can do here is you can use a, a ring signature, right? So a ring signature allows her to, to kind of say on behalf of a ring or a group of people, that something is going on there using rat meat, okay? Okay, but it doesn't tell which one of those people sent the sig signature, okay? So it doesn't reveal who it is and then hence she cannot be fired unless they fire the entire staff. Okay, so in a ring signature scheme we imagine some kind of setup where all of them have public verification key for signature scheme Right? And, and the one who wants to make a ring signature knows the secret key associated with her own public key. And she can kind of form this ring and make a signature. Uh, and the properties is, okay, so everybody has a public verification key. And ring is any subset of those parties. Okay? Um, any, any of one who can, can choose a ring that includes themselves and make a, a ring signature. And it doesn't involve any of the other parties. They may not even be aware that somebody is making a ring signature in, in their name. Okay, so just a ring signature only proves that somebody from the ring signed the message. And it doesn't reveal who in the ring it was that signed the message. Okay, and so on. And we will basically need four algorithms. One that generates a common reference string. Um, one that generates a, a signature key pair, okay, including comma reference string. And then given a ring, you can, if you have a secret key that corresponds to one of these verification keys in the ring, create a signature and it, it should verify if generated honestly. Okay, and informally, well, we have correctness that somebody in the ring can generate a ring signature, we have anonymity that it leaks no information about which member signed the message, and then we have kind of an unforgeability property that you cannot forge a ring signature if you are outside the ring. Okay, underlying the ring signature, I'm going to construct here, I'm going to use a weak Boyen signature scheme where we have a Verification key, that's just G raised to X. Okay, and G will be a group element specified in the common reference string. And to sign a message Y, we compute G to the 1 over X plus Y. And as a quite efficient verification operation. Okay. And notice that this verification equation here, that's a pairing product equation. Okay. So that's exactly the kind of statements that we can prove things about, okay? Because this, just two constants paired with each other, right? So that's just one, that's the target. And in here we might have some secret variables and in, in our scheme, the signature and, and the verification key are going to be secret variables. Okay, and, and this is secure under the strong Diffie-Hellman assumption. Okay, so now for the ring signature scheme. So we're going to have a common reference ring which is exactly like the common reference ring for non-interactive witness indistinguishable proofs. 
we're going to have verification keys, which are basically verification keys for this bonnet boyan signature scheme. And to create a ring signature, we're going to do the following, okay? First, you make a one-time signature on the message in the ring, generated with a, a, a session one-time verification key generated on, on the flash. Now we sign that one, so that kind of certifies the verification key while eh? Now you make commitments to the verification key and the signature, and the reason you commit to them is because you don't want to reveal who it was that made the ring signature. But since they are now committed, it's kind of the hiding property guarantees that the verifier cannot see who it was that made the signature. And then you give a witness indistinct proof that indeed inside these committed values we have a signature on Y. And you can do that because the verification is essentially a pairing product equation, right? And here we have the commitments just as in the non-interactive zero-knowledge proofs. So that follows exactly the structure that we have. And we also have to make a proof that indeed C contains a verification key from the ring. So it is something, somebody from the ring that signed the message. And notice here that we don't actually need the zero-knowledge property. It's enough that it's a witness indistinguishable, right? Somebody from the ring signed the message, and we just want it to be hard to distinguish which out of the many possible people it is that signed the message. Okay, so let me sketch how these witness indistinct proofs work. Okay, so we have commitments, C and L, to respect the verification key and the signature. And the, what we really want to do is, is to prove that these committed variables satisfy this pairing product equation, right? So Y is actually public, so this, this is kind of some public element, but V is a variable, and S is a variable, and this is some, some constant. So this is a simple pairing product equation, and now we'll give a witness interesting proof that these committed values actually satisfy the verification equation. Okay? And the proof is very simple. When you write it out, it has this form, it's one group element. Okay? And to verify it, basically what we do is we check with these constants, with these committed values, we do the pairing, right? So exactly the same as here, just with the committed elements. And now we have H times some factor pi. Okay, so it's complete. You can, can verify that indeed the proof would work out. It's perfectly witness indistinguishable well when H has order N. Okay, no matter which witness you have, it would give the same proof. And it's sound because we could switch to an H which has order Q. And in that case, all these values in module in the order P subgroup would actually satisfy the pairing product equation, the verification equation. Okay? So that's one of the witness industry proofs and the other one is that we have a commitment to for to some value that is actually in the ring. Uh, I'm going to skip skip that since I'm running a little short on time. Um, the interesting thing about this proof is actually that it is of sublinear size. It actually turns out that it's only square root of, of n where n is the size of the ring size. Okay? So to sketch the, the security proof, we get perfect anonymity because we set up the common reference string with order n, h of order n, so the commitments are perfectly hiding, so they could contain these signature for any of the parties, right, because they're perfectly hiding, and the proofs are perfectly witness indistinguishable, so you cannot see who it was actually that signed something. And at the same time, they're computationally enforceable because we could switch to H of order Q, 
And in that case, we could simply extract decrypt and find out who it was that made the signature and actually decrypt and get that signature out. Okay? So these perfectly witness non-interactive witness indicing proofs actually give us ring signatures, a very simple ring signature scheme, and one which has sublinear complexity, just costs square root in group elements. Okay. So, so the final thing I wanted to talk about, um, I wanted to return to these equations here, because what I've given you so far is witness indistinguishability. And that's fine for some applications such as ring signatures, but in some cases you might want to have zero knowledge. And the question is, are these proofs also zero knowledge? Okay. So you could ask as a first question, what about these non-interactive witness indistinguishable proofs? Are they also zero knowledge? Do they have a strong privacy property? And in general, we don't know that to be true. And the problem is that the simulator may not know a witness and hence not be able to create a proof. But it turns out that it, they are actually, in some cases, zero knowledge. They're zero knowledge when this target elements for the pairing product equations are all ones. Okay? And to, to demonstrate that, we'll use this following observation. I'm going to use G, the generator, as a commitment as well. And trivially, that's a commitment to one. Right? And if H has order Q, then it's a you need perfectly binding commitment to one modulo p. But if H has order n, then we could actually, at the same time, think of G as a commitment to both one, obviously, but also as a commitment to zero. So now if we look at these three types of equations, the question is, can we actually find a witness so that we can simulate the proof. And if we start down here, it turns out that we can actually, we can simply set all the secret x variables as one, and all the secret x exponents as zero. And notice we have rewritten the equation like this to this one here, but this one here could be the committed value in g. And if h has order n, we can open g as a commitment to zero, so this might be a zero as well. We cancel out this term, and now we actually have a witness for this equation being satisfied. And if you look at the quadratic equations, it's exactly the same, right? G is a commitment to one, but it could at the same time be seen as a commitment to zero. Okay, so this one is gone, and now if we have all zeros, this equation is satisfied. The only problem is up here, because we might not be able to find something that actually pairs to, to the target, but if the target value is 1, then, so for all parent product equations, the targets are 1s, then we also have a witness here. We can use the x values as 1s, and this equation is satisfied. Okay? So if all the targets for the parent product equations are 1s, we can actually find a witness, and hence we can simulate the proof. And when h has order n, we actually get perfect zero knowledge. Okay, so that concludes the talk. Um, so the summary is, I mean, we've seen how pairing-based techniques can really give some, some new insights into non-interactive zero knowledge and non-interactive witness in this initial proofs, right? Give some very simple, some very efficient constructions. Um, it gave us perfect zero knowledge. It gives us practical efficiency. Um, there's a long list of other results you can get. You can get, actually, you cannot get non-interactive zero knowledge in the plane model, we prove that, but you can actually get witness indistinguishable fluency in the plane model without any setup. Uh, you can get universally composable non-interactive zero knowledge proofs using these techniques as well. Um, I also want to mention that they, it really generalizes. I mean, you could use symmetric groups, but also asymmetric where we have two different base groups for the pairing. Uh, you could have composite order, but you can also have prime order. 
You can build it on different assumptions. Uh, you can building on uh, DDH assumptions, decision linear assumptions, or subgroup decision assumption, many other assumptions. So it's really a, a very general uh, framework you can get from pairings for constructing non-interactive zero-knowledge proof and non-interactive witness interesting group proofs. Um, okay, I'd like to thank some of my, my co-authors and collaborators uh, along the way, and, and thank you. And, uh,